evening. This is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. This is tape number 362A, and it is November the 10th, 1978. This tape is going to be part of a series, of, like I did with the SLA recently, and Evelyn Younger, and the House Select Committee on Assassinations. There'll be a few other topics brought in. But for the most part, I believe that I'll be doing one to two to three weeks probably on the new pope and the Vatican and the politics of religion and possibly getting ready for World War III. Before I get into that, I want to mention that Tom Davis in Capitola uh, has a new mailing list. His address is Box 1107 in care of research. That's Aptos, at California. His stores in Capitola, but his mailing address is Aptos. I have that on one of my sheets for those of you that get the tapes regularly. And it's in California, 95993. And for 25 cents, send a self-addressed stamped envelope, or I believe he staples in there six pages, of categories of books available for the holidays. And the list is $25 to cover the cost of printing for the six pages. And uh, there is no reason to be hesitant in ordering these books. You can start at one dollar. Uh, some of them go on up to twenty dollars, some that are hard to get. But Tom has made a point of collecting books that are available for researchers on many, many categories here of the assassinations and conspiracies and uh, an endless uh, division of subjects such as I've given you in a tape on my library catalogs. I get my books from him. And I think it's time for people to support those people that make a effort to invest in this information so you can have it. Several people came to my house a few weeks ago from the Berkeley area and needed some books that I had, and I mentioned buying them from Tom, and I think the woman made a remark, well, I can get them up in Berkeley. I really feel that you should support this project of his. He's invested this money in having these books for you, and they are available. And if you're going to buy anybody a Christmas card for 25 cents or more, if you're going to send a holiday greeting for 25 cents or more, why don't you send money to Tom and get a book list and turn people on to the books that are available? Just reading the categories is a trip in itself. As a matter of fact, you can send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and send people a list of the tapes for 25 cents to cover the printing Again, uh, I can send you packages with lists of all tape cassettes available since March of 1977. And instead of sending greeting cards and wasteful uh, items that you purchase at the store, give people a list of what is available. They may just want something, one subject that will turn them on, and then they'll go on to the next subject and reach out and see the interconnecting uh, links. I think it's very important to turn new people on and don't fall into the category of thinking, well, my conservative relative or my cousin or a very uh, son-in-law or sister or brother isn't interested in this material. The people that you least expect will be interested in and are sometimes the people that you depend upon, your friends, your buddies, the people that you think are so liberal, so enlightened, intelligent, concerned. They turn their backs faster than the other people that you least suspect of turning on to this information. I found that over and over again. I began by wanting to share what I was finding out with the people that I thought were politically liberal or politically active and concerned about making the world a little better place. And each one of them slammed the door, the ones that I originally had met when I first started my research. And they got a little peek at what was happening and said, no, thank you. And then I picked up other people that became interested and communicated and shared their research where I least expected it. So you can send to Tom for a list or send him a check for a few copies of lists and mail them to people or enclose them in packages. Spend 25 cents less on a gift that you're going to give or 50 cents less for any given person. If you're going to spend $5, spend 450 and maybe send them a list of tape cassettes and the accompanying books that go with them because that's where my source of information comes from. Besides the papers that I read, the congressional records and the hearings, it's, a lot of this is done by fine people writing books and doing the research. And I suggest that you think about that with the holidays coming up or send somebody a book with a book list of other books. There's any price range, you name it, it's there. There is no other gift that you can give that is as lasting. This is a gift of life. Because the keys to your survival, I believe, are in this information if people would use it. 
There's enough printed now to demand changes, but people aren't using it. We don't need any more new books. Just use the old material and get it out. And I dwell on this because the holidays are coming, and it is a time of giving. And the best thing you can do is to turn somebody on that you least suspect or people that you know well, and if you think they don't like it, so what? There's people that might need it the most. Just give it to them and see if we can't turn on new readers and new listeners to help spread this information. This evening, uh, November the 10th, and last night, November the 9th, are the 40th anniversary of the Night of the Broken Glass in Germany. This phenomena was only mentioned at the time of the Holocaust. There are very few people in Germany or in the United States that have been taught what took place in 1938 in Germany. The second secretary of the German embassy in Paris was assassinated, and that was the night that triggered off the excuse for Adolf Hitler to go after the Jews as he promised. And one of the ways to solve unemployment in Germany and to keep people busy in factories or shops is to just confiscate them from the Jews, destroy the Jewish business, uh, don't educate Jewish children to work their way into the system of the universities and professions, stop all education and professions, and then begin to exterminate them. It was the night of the broken glass, as I say, it was 40 years ago, when 7,500 Jewish shops, a minimum, were destroyed. At least 191 synagogues were destroyed, over 171 Jewish homes. They just tore in and cut people apart. They not only broke the glass and smashed the furniture, but a woman who came from Germany who took care of my grandmother when she was quite aged and was a German refugee, and members of her family were cut apart in front of her in her home. 20,000 Jews were arrested for the murder of this uh, secretary in the Paris embassy. And then the stores and factories were confiscated, and the edicts came out. Uh, no children would go to German schools. Of course, November the 9th, 1978, in St. Paul, Minnesota, there was a celebration for the Night of Glass, Nazi style. A synagogue was broken, smashed, thousands of dollars of damage. And there were signs uh, on the synagogue painted, Hitler lives. They must be listening to World Watchers tapes. Or they know, and I know, that Hitler does indeed live. The overriding message of Dialogue Conspiracy on KLRB for seven years and the World Watchers now on private tapes for already a half a year has always been that fascism, totalitarian dictatorship, doesn't just appear. It happens, it's planned, and it is manipulated by a certain group of individuals whose names run throughout the history of our times from 1919 up to the present time. I made a study of finding out who gives the orders, how they got the power, how they kill and assassinate to maintain the order, and how they cover up the, the murders and the conspiracies by which the government officials maintain their power. They do that through the media, the courts, the medical profession, and the police and investigative bodies. During the last eight years of research, I've escalated my interest away, or along with Lee Harvey Oswald and his Nazi friends, to the larger connections of Oswald, specifically to Argentine and to Poland and New Orleans and the Washington, D.C., Dallas connections, which includes the Netherlands and Britain directly and indirectly, but the physical uh, relationship of Lee Harvey Oswald to his friend, specifically Alexander Zeiger, who came from Poland and went to Argentina and then to the Minsk radio factory in the Soviet Union, and the Polish connection has always been of interest to me. Uh, at the time that the Pope died, when Pope Paul I died, I was concerned about the amount of deaths in the Vatican, and so were other people. We'll go into that more in detail in other tapes or the rest of the tape today. I was concerned about the deaths that took place in the Vatican of a cardinal from China, one from Moscow from Russia, another one from Poland, and another ambassador to the Vatican from Turkey who died in June of 78, and then the Pope himself died. And when you get that many deaths, you want to know su bono or who gains, uh, what is happening with all these deaths in the Vatican. And I'm not the only one who is questioning these deaths. There have been many articles in Europe and in the United States about the quick death of Pope John Paul I. When this happens, when so many deaths accompany 
uh, the death of a pope, it's time to take a hard look behind the scenes. It was June the 10th, 1978, when an ambassador, Taha Karim, he's 62 years old, was wounded in the neck and shoulders and slain, and he was the ambassador to the Vatican from Turkey. Three ambassadors from Turkey have been killed. That was in June. But then Archbishop Nicodem, I can't pronounce it properly, I'm sure, from the World Council of Churches, one of their six presidents, a um, member of the Greek Orthodox Church, died on the lap of Pope John Paul I when he went to see him at the Vatican. Now, this particular card, archbishop, not a cardinal, was uh, instrumental in bringing Russian Orthodox Church into the World Council of Churches in 1961. And uh, those of you that have the Torbett document uh, have read sections of the allegations of the World Council of Churches and the Russian Tsars and the Tsars exiles and their role in the assassination of John Kennedy. And at the time that he was instrumental in bringing the Russian Orthodoxy into the World Council of Churches in 61 was the exact period when Alexander Zeiger, again in Minsk, was introducing Marina Oswald to Lee Harvey Oswald. Because without Marina's testimony, there'd be no case against Lee Harvey Oswald for killing the President of the United States. This uh, Archbishop died, as I say, on the lap of John Paul I. If you don't have the Torbett document, again, you can get it for $15 from Tom Davis at Research, and this would uh, incorporate it, and this would make a wonderful Christmas present for somebody to give to you or for you to buy for another person. I don't want to get too far off the track with this Polish Pope and his links to uh, I.G. Farben and the Nazis in the Polish area that I'm very suspicious of. But I want to turn you on to an article in Forbes, if you can get it from the library, October the 30th, 1978. It's about a corporation, the Schlumberger operation. It's called A Singular and Mysterious Giant. Schlumberger's chairman and chief executive, Jean Rebaud, is head of Schlumberger's. And it goes into their multi-billion dollar oil field service agency that's set up in Louisiana, Nigeria, the North Sea, and Kuwait. It was Jean de Menil, the head of Schlumberger. This one is Jean Rebaud, a Russian czarist exile, the president of Schlumberger, who used his company in 1960 to 62 to smuggle hand grenades and mines and missiles for double check, the CIA front that was going to invade Cuba. And the Schlumberger name was put on boxes with false labeling. The operation involved uh, the connections of the white Russian community, the Russian exiles, the Solidaris, and Jean de Menil was the front for this operation and the assassination teams that were planning to kill Fidel Castro and then went on and were responsible for the killing of John Kennedy. John de Menil's uh, group, Schlumberger, had Paul Rygotorotsky uh, connected with them. This is all in the Torbett document. And the links of the espionage arm of the Solidaris, the white Russians, the Polish Tsarists, to the Orthodox Eastern Church is gone into the uh, World Council of Churches and the espionage links is gone into in the Torbett document. And the Archbishop that died from Moscow on the lap of Pope John Paul I from Moscow was active in the World Council of Churches. I have my... Uh, curiosity going or my psychic powers or whatever but when I read the description of the death of John Paul the first and again we'll go into those details later uh, one newspaper described it as a curare poisoning the position he was in and the smile on his face that he had been given the Brazilian uh, drug curare to kill him and I wonder if one of the cardinals either from China or the Archbishop from um, Moscow had brought poison into the Vatican at the time uh, that John Paul died to cause his death, and then they were killed before the tale was ever told. If you uh, study the game plan, which again I want to get into later for World War III involving the United States and China against Russia, uh, this Chinese cardinal, Yu Pin, collapsed just at the time of the death of Pope, uh, Pope Pius, Pope Paul rather, the sixth, that preceded John Paul the first death. That was Cardinal Montini. At one time he was a secretary to the Vatican, and he worked with the new present pope in Rome 
the two years that he was there before he went in the priesthood when he was studying for a Ph.D. in Rome as a secretary of the Vatican. He was writing passports for Nazis to Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay in that interim, the years 1946 to 1948. And those are the years that this new pope was in Rome studying. So that two persons were in the Vatican, the Chinese Cardinal Yu Pin, who collapsed, when at the time of Pope Paul's funeral, he went there after one pope had died, and then the other archbishop from Moscow from the World Council of Churches. And I wonder if either of them could have been used to bring in some kind of curare or poison. We know that popes can't go over the counter in Rome just buying a little package of poison. Uh, the cardinals, rather, over the counter buying this kind of thing to do each other in any more than Dr. Byrne could go into uh, Washington too long and send somebody with a false name to buy quaaludes. But nobody checks the cardinal's robes or under their robes or whatever they have under those robes. And because these men died um, in the Vatican, I wonder if they were the conduit, just like Sam Giacana and John Rosselli, were the middlemen between the Central Intelligence Agency and the organized crime and the killing of John Kennedy. But when the House Select Committee got warming up, these men and Carlos Prius Sequeiros and Charles Nicoletti and the others died. William Sullivan died. The middlemen died. And that's why I wonder about these sudden deaths. Then there was another death in the Vatican, uh, not right directly in the Vatican, but in Rome. And only the Washington Post picked this one up, dated October 17, 1978. You may want to look that up. It said that there were, are only two Polish cardinals left. Uh, representing Poland uh, as of the 17th because the third Polish cardinal, uh, Bolesław Filipiak, a member of the Vatican Cura, died only last week, which means that the week of October the 7th, the third Polish cardinal died in uh, Rome, and he was a member of the controversial Vatican Cura that the Pope John Paul I was up against because he didn't have the political know-how and the clobber to control this body of men. It's like an innocent uh, president coming in and bugging up against the National Security Council. Pope John Paul I was supposed to be uh, just not experienced enough to handle the cure, but the, the Polish representative on the cure, the cardinal, died. And then John Paul I died, and so we have the Turkish ambassador of the Vatican who was shot, the... Uh, Archbishop from Moscow, the Cardinal from China, the Polish Cardinal, and then the Pope himself. And that is reason enough to wonder who in the hell is going to succeed John Paul I. If that wasn't enough to uh, fire my historic curiosity or healthy paranoia, uh, I keep reminding myself how many times I've warned people who hear me on the radio or take the tapes, how dangerous it was to put a German like Henry Kissinger in the National Security Council, to have Reinhard Galen, the chief of Hitler's Eastern, Eastern Intelligence, make our National Security Council turn the OSS into the CIA and write the script for the way the uh, spy system had taken over Germany and got themselves elected in 1933. And, of course, I've done tapes on Brzezinski and Solzhenitsyn, but the danger of having Brzezinski as the tool is uh, Polish, again Polish, uh, czarist, vicious man, genocidal, uh, part of the trilateral, Bilderbergers, uh, running the National Security Council, uh, wacky for the Rockefeller Combines and all the others, too, the DuPonts and the Henry Fords and the same gangs that gave us World War One and Two. Hand selecting a Polish pope, uh, knowing him in advance, uh, blocking the Italian election so that the German and the American cardinals and the uh, Argentine and the Brazil cardinals got on a very narrow uh, vote the Polish pope in hand picked. Very, very dangerous scene. When this pope was born in 1920, uh, World War I was just over. And he was 19 years old in 1939 when Adolf Hitler went quietly into Poland and into Krakow. Hardly a finger was raised in the town where he lived. And, of course, that was all prearranged. 
He spent the next six years in that town, and I've given you a little piece of a map in case you don't get to the library to mark off the cities where he lived. And you see Krakow there down below. Sometimes it's spelled with a K and sometimes with a C. And Oshwim, O-S-W-I-E-C-I-M, -E is Auschwitz, Oshwim. And Katowice is sometimes Wadowice. That is his hometown. He went between Waterways and Krakow, and he worked in a chemical factory and a quarry, and he was in town six years right in the heart of the extermination camps. And to add fuel to the fire, he worked as a chemist, and he worked as a, in a rock quarry. And I will try to show you through the books I've read and researched in the recent weeks since this man was appointed from this area, that there's only one company that owned the chemical works in Poland, and that was IG Farben, and the corporation the company that used the slave labor for IG Auschwitz from that neighborhood and their quarries and in their work for digging out and making their rubber uh, plants and their chemical plants. Uh, IG Farben ran that operation, and IG Farben had the largest private intelligence, secret service intelligence operation of any multinational corporation. They were the big daddies before ITT and uh, Howard Hughes and the various private industries began their own spy systems. I.G. Farben was into it then. And this particular Pope studied drama. I think of Hollywood with Howard Hughes and Joe Kennedy and uh, various E. Howard Hunt, various people, very much part of the anti-communist infiltration of Hollywood to begin the Red Scare get out all the writers and the humanists and any scripts that ask social questions, bring in the mafia, bring in the whores, bring in the actresses, and forget about the dramas and turn Hollywood into a nightmare of junk and cheapness and send it around the world as entertainment. In between, a few things were sandwiched in there that might have had some meaningful sense, but very, very little considering the talent that was available to Hollywood. I know, I was born and raised down there, and I watched it all come down. Even though I wasn't political in those days, I look back, and it's all very clear to me. And I'm sure as you look back and say these tapes, things will become very clear to you if they haven't already. Now, this guy wanted to study drama. This pope, uh, I call him the popus. <laughs> he wanted to study drama, like E. Howard Hunt. They learned disguises, they learned costumes, and getaway, and infiltration, and impersonation impersonating Jews, you're going to help leave from there. Who did he help? He's supposed to be the assistant of the Jews, and we'll go into that, too. He studied counterintelligence. He worked as a chemist. He worked at a rock quarry. Uh, this pope has been in for quite a few days now, and I haven't really had any identification of exactly what he did, except that People magazine uh, said he hid in the castle of an archbishop when the Germans came through the town and rounded up other young men, when the German invaders uh, were going through in Warsaw, uh, he was in Krakow. That was called Black Sunday there, and they rounded up all the people in Carol's neighborhood, and Carol was alone in the apartment waiting for it to happen. But something wonderful happened. The Germans never came after him. They left him alone, and according to the article you see in the Henry Luce publication, Carol spent the rest of the war hidden in the palace of the Archbishop of Krakow, now, there's no reason in the world to hide in the palace of the Archbishop of Krakow. The Pope knew that Hitler was going into Poland. He knew it all along. There was an agreement, and nobody in Krakow gave the Nazis any problems, so there was no reason for this Pope to hide. And uh, the story is a lot of malarkey and PR job to make you like him and sympathetic to whatever uh, they want you to believe about him. I picked up a wonderful book, uh, a used bookstore in San Jose this week. It's by Adolf Hitler. It's called My New Order. And uh, a lot of people don't know that this book came out. It's a collection of his speeches. It was reduced from $30 to $12.50. It was put out in 1941. And the introduction says, My New Order is a collection of Hitler's speeches set in a running commentary. It's a sequel to Mein Kampf. It's a very rare book. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have not heard about it or known about it. It's frankly chewed by somebody's dog. Uh, it's, uh, the edges, not the paper pages, are chewed at, but it's very precious to me. It's 1,000 pages of speeches of Adolf Hitler. And I looked up the section on Poland. There's a chapter called The Road to War, 
and this was in 1939, uh, September the 19th, the speech in Danzig in 1939, uh, where Adolf Hitler is telling his intent of what he's going to do in Poland. It was exactly uh, one year almost to nine days later, one year after the night of glass in Germany. And he's talking about how he will go after uh, people that resist him, but he said in England they persecute women and children and that he will take care of England and that he will be kind to women and children. And he said, let no mistake, uh, let, let, let make no mistake here. The moment could come very suddenly in which we would use a weapon that which we, with which we cannot be attacked. I hope they do not suddenly begin to think of humanness and the impossibility of waging war against women and children. We Germans do not like that. It is not in our nature. In this campaign, I give an order to spare human beings. And then he said, in quotes, in those places where insane or crazy people do not offer resistance, not one window pane was broken. In Krakow, except for the airfield, the railroad, and the railroad station, which were military objectives, not one bomb fell. On the other hand, in Warsaw, the war was carried on by civilian shootings and that we have to take the whole city because they're crazy. But if you're sensible and you don't act insane or crazy and don't offer resistance, we won't hurt you. Just put down your guns like they did in Krakow, Poland. And, of course, I have books, uh, and I'll give you some volumes and page numbers, where the Hitler told the Pope in Italy, we're going into Poland we have to take Poland and set it up as a bulwark because we're going into Russia. And don't worry. And the Pope said, that's fine with us. Just go ahead and have a field day. And Hitler had told them long in advance what he was going to do. I was looking through the list of uh, inserts that I have with the tapes that go out every week and how many times I have feared Nazis and uh, more of the Night of Glass operation that the synagogue got in St. Paul just this week, just yesterday. But if you compile your pages and put them in a spiral notebook, uh, get a hole puncher and put them in there, they're really valuable to look at. And there's over and over again references to the fear of Nazi control. The book UFO, the Nazi secret weapon, is Hitler alive? Uh, mention of Operation Bernhardt. Jacques Hughes, the men who betrayed France, uh, wanted search for the Nazis. I, this endless book, The Mind of Adolf Hitler by Walter Langer. And I have page after page here of references. Uh, sometimes I wonder if you get tired of hearing about the Nazi uh, fears that I have in this country or for the entire world. But evidently you don't because I get more and more subscribers all the time and uh, maybe the subscriptions will escalate as people realize what is really happening. On June 16th in 1978, I listed library sections for research that I use in my own personal library, and it's from these sections that I pulled out information when the Pope was uh, selected by the Cardinals, the Pope from Poland. The history book sections from 1914 to 1945 that I talk about under the Breaking the Versailles Treaty, the plans to import Nazis to the United States and send them all over the world. The 1946 to 1950 Nazification of the world. Uh, the Alger, his case, the Rosenberg, the Korean War, the Cold War, the House on American Activities, and of course our Hollywood scares, and the 1960 and 70s, the Reverend Moon, the riots, assassinations, and the increase of Nazis in Greece, Brazil, Chile, Zaire, West Germany, England, and all around the world, including the United States. And then my section on religion, the Vatican, and the government collusions, religion, and conspiracies. And then the section that I have of uh, A to Z on biographies and bibliographies of various chemical companies such as IG Farben, Nobel Oil, Dow Chemical, the Onassis Shipping Combines, the Howard Hughes books. And it's from these areas and I mentioned the Bormann Brotherhood and uh, Hitler's agents and uh, parts of Adolf Hitler. And it's from these sections, from the history books and the religious books, that I pulled out my material to begin studying some more. I have the books here, and I've read many of them. And some I buy to put away to read in the future because I know they'll be important. And I've been escalating my library, and if I had more money, I'd get more books and put them away. 
on this area. You just run out of money, unfortunately. Unless I have some secret source, I have to stop going to these bookstores so much. But it's these categories that you have to pull out of to study the history of Poland, of the Nazis, of the Vatican, again, of Mr. Brzezinski and the oil combines that have selected him, and he, in turn, has selected the new pope. Let me remind you that when my first article came out about how was Martha Mitchell kidnapped and the first links of Watergate to Nazis to the American assassination syndrome, I got a letter December the 10th, 1972, which Paul Krasner published in another realist from Andres Papandro, who was kicked out of Greece. He was running for elections in April 67, and he was threatened with knives and sent to Canada. He wasn't killed, and he had read my article and thanked me for appreciating the fact and understanding how it happened that Greece went under a dictatorship. That is one of my most precious letters that I saved. And with that, we'll go to side two of this tape of talking about a dictatorship around the world that could be linked to the Vatican at this time. Good evening. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This is tape number 362, side B, November the 10th, 1978. When I think of this Pope with his drama, I wanted to be an actor and studying drama and all the various activities he's been into and counterintelligence. I think of the play by Genet called The Balcony. I don't know if any of you saw it. There was a movie made of it with um, Shelley Winter. She plays the madam of a whorehouse. And the three main characters are a plumber and a carpenter and another gentleman, I forget his profession, who go into the house of prostitution, and the way they get their kicks is to put on garments of public officials or costumes, and their women are dressed appropriately. And the judge is a British barrister with curls and robe, and a witness uh, who comes before the court pleading for mercy and so forth. And the military man is uh, is a woman with him. He's a soldier with all kinds of ribbons and accolades, and he puts on his costume. And then. There's a gentleman that's a cardinal who wears the cardinal's hat and uh, is dressed as a religious person, and his woman is dressed as a nun. And at, while they're in this house of prostitution, there's some calamity in town, a bomb or some great tragedy has happened, and they can't get the public officials. The people need reassurance that uh, everything is all right in the town, and they're used to these public officials. So they take these men out in their garments, and they do the traditional blessing in the cardinal is paraded down the street giving his blessings to the people. And then the people are satisfied because that's all they wanted anyway was to rest assured that uh, matters were all right with the world, and the cardinal assures them it's that way. Uh, I've mentioned before that Cardinal Montini, who went on to become Pope Paul VI, was in the OSS. Uh, the book on the Golden Triangle and uh, the OSS refers to his working with the intelligence community. And I haven't any doubt that this new pope is not part of the Central Intelligence Galen operation, that he works right into the National Security Council and through the manipulation of the various cardinals, a lot of money and a lot of uh, influence pass through to these particular people, you know, and they get a lot of benefits to the church if they cooperate with the power structure. There's a mutual, mutual uh, affair going here, all of them out to get the so-called communists. Not to make the world better, but to get those damn commies, and they're going to pull together and use their strength, the multinationals and the church known as the Vatican, as well as a lot of other churches, but we're talking about the Vatican right now. There was an article in the Washington Post, November the 3rd, 1978, about the ITT making payments in nine countries. Uh, they're being charged by the Security Exchange Commission, and uh, the ITT company made payments to Indonesia, Iran, the Philippines, Algeria, Nigeria, Mexico, Italy, Turkey, and Chile. And the point is that they gave uh, $8.7 million in foreign payment to these particular countries. And when you read books about I.G. Farben and the Nazis, and ITT and the Nazis, 
Henry Ford and the Nazis, Rockefeller and Nazis, all of them combined with a vested interest in this particular pope and in Mr. Brzezinski. Um, and you read about the Lockheed scandal of Prince Bernhardt uh, getting payoffs of a million dollars or two million dollars from Lockheed, one of the richest men in the world, the Vatican, one of the richest, if not the richest combine in the world in terms of property and holdings. They just spent five million dollars for the ceremonies of burying one pope and bringing in another pope. That cost five million dollars. But how do we know what agents and what subterfuge the ITT would use to manipulate, to get rid of that one gentle, kind, peace-loving Pope John Paul I. Uh, how do we know what money and effort goes into silencing people, manipulating, and treating him in the manner that they did? We know that this clandestine money is going overseas. The board of directors, the stockholders, allegedly don't even know the ITT people, that a little sum of eight point seven million changed hands. And when you read the role that ITT had in Nazi Germany in Watergate at the present time, uh, with its interlocking connections to all these fascist links, I'm sure that a little penny of this goes into some of the cover ups, whether it's for the news media that praise this particular gentleman or create movies such as the one Billy Graham was over there making in Poland or John Michener was making in Krakow, these people traveled to Poland. Goodness knows what it takes for the intelligence operations to set up a traveling trip. This particular pope, uh, the Polish pope, was in the United States. They said many times, at least twice, visited 11 American cities, was literally campaigning as a cardinal, assuring his position all the American Catholics knew him, and the American Catholics have enough money to let the other cardinals know that they know who he is. He spent a lot of time in the United States, and we'll go into those cities, too. And then he was in Germany last month, and those cardinals knew him, and also uh, with PR jobs of kind that ITT have. Goodness knows where this missing millions go, but that's the kind of loose money that's floating, and we can't say specifically where it goes, but this is the kind of espionage money it takes to swing the concealment, the death of one pope, and to get in the one that you really want the cold warrior right to his last bottom booty. Now, in the last few weeks since the Polish Pope has been hand-selected by the Cardinal, I've broken down my research, the categories that I gave you the background for, and we have spent a lot of time on background, but because I'm going to spend two or three weeks on these tapes, I felt it was necessary. And I've broken down into the subjects that I'll mention briefly or at length uh, I want to give them to you just as an introduction so you know what I'm thinking about the Pope and how I'm thinking it. And then at the end of all the tapes, we'll summarize it and uh, give it a direction for, that you can follow in the future, if, if possible, and I hope you will. First of all, I got my books out that refer to I.G. Farben, and that's the area that I want to go into with you first, because if I say he worked for I.G. Farben, there are many people never heard of I.G. Farben, believe it or not, but there are. And therefore, we have to go into the books on I.G. Farben. And I'll give you a bibliography this week, next week, and the week after of books that cover that section. The history of I.G. Farben, how it got started, and what kind of a company it is. Then I studied I.G. Farben in Poland and its overseas investments, but particularly how they took over every chemical plant in Poland. And keep in mind, and I reiterate it, this young man was 19 in Poland, and he was 25 when he left, and he lived right within inches uh, of Auschwitz, uh, right in the heart of Exterminationville. Then I made another divider section. This is the way I work. I get in my mind certain subjects and make manila folders, and then the research that I read I put into these particular sections to see what kind of a picture or conclusions I can draw. And then I did one section on I.G. Farben and Auschwitz, the meeting of the directors of the company of I.G. Farben with, Her with Hermann Goering and Himmler and Meyer Heydrich, where they actually sat down, the Farben directors and the heads of the solution for the Jews, the final solution, was made in the presence of the directors of I.G. Farben. Then the, the directions of I.G. Farben to Standard Oil. 
the Rockefeller Combine, not only currently with Mr. Kissinger and Brzezinski, but early in the game, before World War II, how they signed deals with Rockefeller and the Standard Oil that held back the American production of rubber, but which made the war possible. Uh, the war couldn't go on without IG Farben in Germany and in Poland with their factories where they were making simulated rubber plants or tires and so forth. And then the connections of IG Farben to Henry Ford, uh, the man who received the false prodigals of Zion, the elders of the prodigals of Zion, who continues to send to Africa and South America today publications of what were supposed to be secret meetings of Jews to take over the world, which was absolutely false. IG Farben worked very close with Henry Ford Motor Company and the Ford Co Combine. Then the connections of IG Farben Company with Nobel Oil Fields. And I might tell you before I get down the list that IG made all of the gas, uh, 20, enough to kill 20 million people at Auschwitz. They, I think they only got to kill about 8 million in the uh, gas chambers before the armies came and relieved Poland of German occupation and the Russians came in. Keep in mind now that the Pope is violently anti-communist. He hasn't made one statement against the Nazis, except some PR thing that he helped some Jews. But also keep in mind, if I keep repeating it a hundred times, that this Alexander Zeiger left Poland as a Jew, went to Argentina, and then ended up in the radio factory in Minsk with Lee Harvey Oswald, introducing him to Marina, the czarist, the little princess of the czarist community in uh, Minsk. I.G. Farben's connections to Nobel oil fields, the Nobel family, uh, their oil was confiscated when the Russians took over the Bolsheviks and the revolution. And their connections, of course, through this vast library I have, and which you can get at the libraries of the Royal Dutch Shell in the Netherlands, the Nobel interest in Queen Juliana. Now, Prince Bernhardt, who founded the Bilderbergers, was a board of directors of I.G. Farben in 1937. He was a member of the Gestapo, the SS, Hitler's SS, in 37. And then he proposed the Queen Juliana in 1939. And that was the wedding of I.G. Farben to the Royal Dutch Shell. And then after the war, in the 50s, the Bilderberger was formed on the suggestion of a Polish agent. We'll go into that, too, to form the Bilderbergers, where they have secret meetings every year and decide who should be assassinated and who should be overthrown. Whatever is good for I.G. Farben, I suppose, uh, is okay with Rockefeller's Royal Dutch Shell, Ford Motor Company, ITT, the DuPonts, uh, the killer teams, General Electric, and so forth. Then I.G. Farben spy network, and this is where I'm suspicious that the Pope was recruited in his youth to go into their calendar intelligence operation. IG set up a spy network around the world and sent people and businessmen and offices all over the world with their counterintelligence and spy network. For example, in the book uh, just titled, very non-subtly, IG Farben, I've given you this bibliography, on page 15 it says, IG Farben served the Nazi state by developing a new system of spies, and the Farben spies were good. They were invisible. They belonged, and they operated in a respectable, in an upfront manner, you see. They set up men to salvage as the battle was ending, from Norway to France and in Poland and in Czechoslovakia. IG took control of every chemical plant of importance. They were in there, right in there in the chemical plants, and this pope worked his way through school while at a chemical plant in Poland. On page 16 to 17 of that book, it says, I.G. Farben seized the plants, all chemical plants, that produced for the Nazis. And I.G. Farben was paid off by the Nazis. They were given their laborers. They didn't have to feed them. The laborers lost about 45 pounds a month. They walked six miles a day from their camp, which had no heaters to keep them warm and uh Nothing, of course, in the summer to cool them off. They had to walk six miles to I.G. Auschwitz, to the factory of uh, I.G. Auschwitz. And the Nazis provided the labor. And they were whipped if they weakened or died, and they were just whipped and dropped dead. At the end of the day, they counted them to see 
if any had escaped, of course, and they lined up the dead bodies to make the count in front of the living ones. And this is the way the factory was run. They figured it was cheaper to throw in new men, boys working every day, work them till they die, and bring in a new bunch, 20,000, another 20,000, another 20,000, just work them down, starve them. If they die of disease, throw them away. If they were in the hospital more than three weeks, they were sent to the crematory. They, no matter what, if they had an operation or I don't even believe they had much surgery there except for experimentation, but they couldn't be sick more than a certain time or they were automatically uh, killed. And they walked to work to this factory. This is the town where this new pope came from. I.G. Farben, uh, it goes on in this book, said that Hitler counted on them. Uh, one way he could win the war and not survive the world was through the help of I.G. Farben. That his idea, Hitler's idea, along with their corporation, was to split up the Allies, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union, split them up. Now, again, a split is possible. They, this was their plan, and the author of I.G. Farb in the book said uh, this would be possible one more time around. The split was the main chance, they said, for I.G. Farben and the Germans to stay alive. And they very carefully planned when they realized in 1943, when they couldn't take Russia, that they were going to rearm and set their ways again to take over the world, that they would split Russia from the United States and England, split up the Allies. And this, these were the years that I.G. Farber was planning that when this pope was living in that town. Uh, he stayed there until 1945 and in 46 went to Rome and is a violent anti-communist now separating us, even though he saw the horrors of the Nazis. Assume even he was under forced slave labor or whatever. He worked there. He saw it. If he was forced to do it and then damned them afterwards. Uh, I know that uh, District Attorney Jim Garrison, from, who's now a judge from New Orleans, the DA there was at, at Auschwitz. He took pictures of it. I have his autograph book with a picture of what he saw when he went in there. And he swore that he never wanted to see the world be Nazified again. And that's one reason he got into the research and the Galen operation and the Clayshaw part of the assassination. Uh, he doesn't talk much about it publicly, and I don't know why, but he told me about it. He gave me his book and gave me the pictures that he took himself there. Well, the Farben book talks about the technique of keeping the German story of life is separating Russia, and that's what... The new dissidents are doing, they're appealing to the Jews. The Jews are falling for it to keep, fight us, make us fight Russia when Russia actually, the Soviet Union, was the one that stopped the concentration camps and stopped the killing by holding the line and then moving west again. Uh, this book on Farben said that this will be the weapon for another war, is the use of these agents inside of countries like France and Poland and so forth to split us up against each other enemies will divide the people that should be friends and split them up. The book says the war with the Nazis and their friends has never stopped waning. It is a holy crusade against the East, against the Soviet Union. That's what the book on I.G. Farben says, page 16 or 17. And I think about Pope John Paul II working for a chemical plant taken over by Farben, studying counterintelligence, going to the Vatican, going to Rome, the years that the passports were written for the war criminals to get out of the continent of Europe, and uh, he could very much be part of the espionage operation of I.G. Farben. This book goes on, the book I.G. Farben, and says that the war was planned long before Hitler came to power. The I.G. Nazis used their agents, and they passed them all over the world in every country, and they had alliances with the Swiss, including Santo's lab, the medical lab, which then goes on to make LSD and LSD experiments at Harvard that then permeated this country and began to knock out the brains of our better youth. Just to read you a little bit about the IG agents, this book, IG Farb and the Quiet War, said the widely spread sales organization of IG was used to plant Nazi agents in strong posts throughout the world. The international network of IG siphoned all kinds of information from other countries back to the intelligence centers of the Nazi party and the Wehrmacht. The spy of fiction is a lurid figure who emerges in disguise from the underworld. 
In striking contrast, Germany's most effective intelligence agents were solid, respectable businessmen selling excellent goods and advanced industrial techniques, and also the church was used as part of the Farben setup. Later, they went in as an international cartel and allied with Swiss concerns such as Siba, Sandoz, and Geige. It's Sandoz Labs that began making the LSD, as I said, it was distributed around the country, and then they forced the English chemical industry into line. Following that lead of IG, the major chemical firms of Great Britain, by 1926, organized into a single concern, the empirical, imperial chemical industries, and they worked with IG Farben. Farben set up this spy system par excellence. So back to the studies of the Pope. I'm going to run down these categories, but this is a spy network that I believe he could be connected with. Then I.V.G. Farben went into the newspaper media business, and I will go into on other tapes with Henry Luce, the Catholic Church, Luce setting up the Bilderbergers too, along with a pole by the name of Reitinger, R-I-T-I-N-G-E-R, and Henry Luce and working with this combine. And Farben set up the newspaper news media propaganda machine for Goebbels, and it's that news media that is functioning in this country to keep the Nazi parts out of the news so carefully. Then Farben will say in the rise of Hitler, the importance without I.G. Farben, there would be no Adolf Hitler. The connections of Farben to oil, to rubber, to fertilizer, ammonia, and to dyes. The links of Farben to drugs, to sulfur, to aspirin, methadone, novocaine. Then the I.G. Farben links to Robert Kennedy and Princess Radzwill the sister of Jacqueline Onassis, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and her influence on the uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy to let Farben begin uh, building up their empire again after World War II. Robert Kennedy did that for his dear sister-in-law, Princess Radswell, the sister of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Farben owns Agfa Fil Films and large uh, photographic laboratories and filmmaking uh, properties. And then I want to discuss the prosecution at, at Nuremberg of members of Farben and how they got off. A handful of them got a slop, slap on the wrist. Also, the warnings that uh, people were given about them after World War II and how they were ignored, the warnings after World War One, and then again setting up, as I say, the Bilderbergers after World War II with Prince Bernhardt from the board of directors of IG Farben. And, of course, the Farben money, a lot of it is in the Swiss banks, Credit Suisse, and in Permandex. And, of course, those organizations are linked to the assassinations of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, which makes the Farben uh, Corporation very modern and hardly relegated to the history section. And then the Farben connections to South America and the fascist dictatorships and in the United States to particular uh, politicians. And that is the Farben connection because they did own the chemical plants in Poland, and this pope worked at a rock quarry at chemical plants in Poland at the Farben companies, and he lived right in the Auschwitz, Auschwitz area of Krakow. He couldn't have missed the smell, couldn't have missed the action, and we don't know yet which factory he worked at, but it had to be owned by I.G. Farben. Another connecting section, entirely different section than just the Farben specifically, is the Vatican itself. And, of course, I'm studying the Polish power of Brzezinski and Rockefeller and Haig, the charge of NATO, the trilateral connections, and the Bilderbergers and Prince Har Bernhardt, the Polish connections to the RCIA, DIA, National Security Agency, Council of Foreign Relations, and trilateral the Polish power is uh, here, and the Polish jokes, I think, that came out a few years ago are just a joke on us. I think Polish power is alive and very strong. Then the Vatican connections to the Nazis uh, of Mr. Montini, the secretary of the Vatican, became the cardinal, and then the pope and his passports into South America and China and Africa of Nazi war criminals. Then the Credit Swiss Bank, the banking for the Vatican in the Morgan Guarantee Trust, and I'll be going into the connections of Aldo Moro and Italian politics, Henry Luce, 
the media and the Vatican, the devout Catholics, and for a while, Claire Luce was uh, envoy to Italy, ambassador to Italy, the Vatican connections of Henry Luce, and the tying up of the media, and then the Vatican investments in the United States, the wealth in stocks and property or cash, what it means to the United States, and how uh, it controls uh, so much of our thinking because of their wide investments, the relationship of the Vatican to labor, and even the Vatican owns the entire Watergate Hotel. George Seldes wrote in 1968 about this $60 million building that was constructed in Washington, D.C., totally owned by the Vatican, and says it was the Watergate Hotel. And later, it turns out that that's where John Mitchell has moved with his wife, Martha, after they've designated that Richard Nixon will be the selected president for 1968 and 1972. Rosemary Woods lives at the Watergate Hotel. Claire Luce has the largest apartment right there at the Watergate Hotel right now. An architect from Italy took care of the building. It's entirely owned or was, and I can't imagine that they'd give it away at this point, at the Watergate Hotel. And then there's certain men in the Vietnam War of the Vatican who want us to use a full atomic war power in Southeast Asia against the Vietnamese, Cardinal Spellman and others. Uh, Cardinal Pacelli was the uh, gentleman who pushed for the Spanish Civil War and pressured President Roosevelt not to intervene to stay neutral. And various personalities were involved in coaxing him to stay neutral while Italy and Germany sent in troops, and Henry Luce told us that all of the Spanish Republic were communist, and they weren't, and that bloody war took place, and the Vatican got their payoffs. ITT had the newest, biggest building in Madrid and uh, carried on with their corporation. They took the land back that had temporarily been given uh, to the natives and starved out even the Catholic population again for greed and power in Spain. The saga of the Vatican and the Civil War, I won't go into so much on the tapes or in South America, except where it's pertinent to searching out, again, who is Pope John Paul II. And then in that category, besides studying uh, the Farben connections and the Vatican power and holdings and the role of Vatican in politics, I have made about 20 different dividers or files for Pope John Paul I, where I'm putting in chronological order his life, what he did uh, each year that I can get from the media as the story unfolds. The story of his childhood, his education with his father, his mother died when he was young, where they said he was at a certain time, where he got his education, what he was supposed to be doing. I think this has to be checked and double-checked because there aren't any two stories that have come out yet that seem to coincide. Then the era, what was he doing during the war years? What, this 19-year-old from 1939 to 1945, what exactly was he doing? And I don't have all the answers. I'm going to ask you to help me research and various books or articles that you read that come out about him, anything that you see, any dates, any letters that you can write to public officials and get some information of where he was from the age 19 to 25, would be very interesting because you just can't escape the fact of the area he was in and who he was working for and his callous, cold, indifferent speeches uh, as soon as he was made pope to what the Nazis did in that area, and he's totally anti-communist. And he already, in his very first speech, and we'll go into those, has told the cardinals that they have red on their gowns because that's for blood, and you have to be prepared to die again for Jesus. Uh, go into his employment. I have a category here to check out. Not anything that he did in the ages of 19 to 25. I know he went canoeing. I know he went hiking. And he went to the theater. But I really think that Krakow, Poland, and Oshwin, and uh, Waterways wasn't exactly fun area. To make him uh, talk, you'd think that he really had a very normal teenage life of healthy outdoor sports and choices of professions and a job while he went to school and he lived in the castle, the archbishop. Things went pretty rosy for this guy who, according to some stories, was helping Jews escape. I don't think he'd last an hour. If he did, he may have been taking the Jewish names off of books of people that had deceased and then given them to people like uh, Alexander Zeiger to go down to Argentina for a while to pick up the expertise or radio work to manage that Minsk radio factory. Uh, I want to keep track of all of his theater experiences or articles about his work in the theater. 
and also his contact with Jews in Poland. That's an important thing. There's a lot of PR jobs about his helping Jews in Poland, and I want to go into some of that with you and also uh, pursue these Alexander Zeiger Polish connections. If it was a Pole that set up the Bilderbergers, if it was a Pole that introduced Lee and Marina Oswald to each other who was down in Argentina, and if a Pole is the head of our National Security Council directing our armies and our entire spy systems and entertains and knows this Pope prior to his election that came upon the death of another man who only lived 30 days. We have to go into that. I have also uh, pulled out my books on the Vatican and the passports, the years 1946 to 48, that this particular pope was in Rome to see just who got their passports in those years and what countries. Now, that's a lot of work, but those are the categories I'm going into and the role or the association with the Pope of Paul VI that this pope has. I know that this particular uh, pope didn't have to have an autopsy on the man that preceded him because Montini made an order in 1975 when he was just about in his 80s, I guess he was 78 at the time, uh, no autopsies on popes, not for religious reasons, but just a blanket, no autopsies on popes. And that clears the way for murdering anybody who follows them who isn't part of the OSS or the CIA because uh, there's no edict or way to overturn that unless this man wants it now. But a man who was almost 80 made that edict and that held firm so there couldn't be an autopsy on the death of this other fellow. How convenient that a man who has a protege, Montini has a protege such as this new Pope Pius, who knew him in Rome and knew, helped his career get books published and promoted a PR job on him before he died, has a law, uh, a church edict, no autopsies, so that the man he's working with slides into home base, just as easy as you can say, one, two, three. I'm charting the travels, the visits, the cities he's been to, his first speeches, what he's saying, where he's going to go in the future, and that is the way we'll break down some of the important information on the next tapes for you about this particular Pope, John Paul II.